A new era of civil aviation has arrived with the opening of Changi Airport, Singapore's newest gateway to the world. Changi Airport covers an area of over 1,600 hectares, five times that to the previous airport at Paya Lebar. In terms of handling capacity, Changi is one of the largest airports in Asia. Its runway can handle 38 landings and takeoffs an hour. The passenger terminal building is designed to cope with 10 million passenger movements annually, including arrivals and departures. The central area is for passenger handling, while the two parallel finger piers are for aircraft to park right next to the building. With aero bridges, passengers step from the plane to the airport building and travelators carry them smoothly to the processing counters. The arrival and departure halls are on separate floors to simplify passenger guidance. For the flight-weary traveller, the terminal is a step closer to home. Waterfalls and plants abound, creating a garden city in miniature. Aesthetics and functional requirements are harmoniously blended. Singapore Changi Airport grew from conception to reality in only six years. A remarkable takeoff for an airport of its size. What spurred its construction in so short a time? Over the years, Singapore has emerged as an air traffic junction. This is due partly to its strategic location and partly because the government has a very liberal aviation policy exchanging traffic rights with many countries. At Paya Lebar Airport in 1981, there were 34 international carriers operating through Singapore to 66 countries. Air transport is a chief vehicle for our tourist industry as more than 80% of tourists arrive by plane. For 26 years, Biolabor Airport had served our civil aviation needs. But the airport had also reached saturation point. Between 1970 and 1980, the number of passenger movements had increased four and a half times, from 1.6 million to 7.2 million annually. During the 70s, air cargo had also increased eight times, from 21,000 tonnes to over 170,000 tonnes. It was estimated that by 1984, there would be 83,000 aircraft movements and over 11 million passenger movements annually. These volumes would be beyond the handling capacity of Paya Lebar Airport, with its single runway. Based on these projections, there was an urgent need for a larger passenger terminal and a second runway by 1984. Expansion was considered for Paya Lebar Airport, but there were physical constraints. 
To build a second runway, Sarangoon River would have had to be diverted and the swampy riverbed dredged and filled. This engineering problem was further compounded by the need to excavate the 10-year-old Tempinus dumping ground. As the airport stood amidst a residential area, some 5,000 families would have had to be resettled. The building of a second runway would also add to the noise pollution endured by residents living near the airport. And air pollution would affect a larger area as a flight path would be towards the city. These factors did not favour the expansion of Pyalaba Airport. An alternative site had to be found at Changi on the eastern tip of the island. The choice was made in June 1975. There were several advantages. Changi had a military airfield which has reduced the need to acquire large areas of private land. There would be fewer engineering and resettlement problems as Changi was less densely populated than Paya Lebar. The idea of an airport by the sea was also appealing, as there would be less noise pollution, and from a safety viewpoint, the flight paths would be over the sea. Changi offered more scope, as additional land could be reclaimed from the sea. This would give freer rein to the imagination and creativity of our airport planners. For these reasons, it was found technically feasible to build an international airport with two runways by 1984. When was the master plan conceived? In the mid-1975, we have uh, drawn up a concept plan for Changi Airport and our airport planners have gone to Europe and in Asia to study some of the major airports on their operational and design uh, concept. So in January 1976, we employed the Netherlands airport consultant uh, company who have done the Schiphol airport design and construction to review and to make improvements on our concept. In uh, mid-1976, a final master plan has been uh, drawn up together with the NACO consultants. And this has been adopted by our government for implementation. The master plan features a passenger terminal which is located in the centre as it forms the heart of the airport. The runways placed on both sides of the central building area for functional reasons. They are orientated parallel to each other because the wind direction is either northeast or southwest. A control tower in front of the passenger terminal is located at the head of the airport for a clear and commanding view of the airfield. To the north of the passenger terminal, a cargo and maintenance complex. And to the northwest, an air traffic control center located at the highest point in Changi. Other facilities include fire stations, flight kitchens, roads and reservoirs. An airport project of this magnitude would normally take 10 years to build, but Changi airport planners gave themselves five and a half years to build an international airport from scratch, with half the area yet to be reclaimed from the sea. Time was of the essence. In late 1975, nearly 683,000 square meters of land were acquired for the airport project. It included the scenic Changi Beach, a popular weekend resort for many Singaporeans. Changi had the finest stretch of beach with smooth white sand and clear water. While sun seekers flocked to the beach, tourists went to Changi village 
where a wide variety of things could be had for a bargain. The shops were well patronized by the families of the Royal Air Force stationed at Changi Air Base. They would have to be demolished, but new ones would be built in their place. Changi Village would live on. But not so these stately holiday bungalows with their wide lawns facing the sea. Soon the waves will lap on a further shore. The restful tranquility and old world charm of these bungalows will be but a nostalgic memory. All was reduced to rubble. Convalescent homes, a seafood restaurant, and a newly built motel. 558 buildings were demolished, and nearly 700 squatters and farmers resettled. Twenty-five kelongs were uprooted, as a seabed beneath was needed for reclamation. Six crane barges took four to eight days to demolish each kelong. Even wartime mines had to be detected and destroyed. Site clearance began in late 1975, when the first contingent of bulldozers came to clear the land south of the existing military runway. Land had to be cut and filled to the required level for the construction of the runway, parking bays and buildings. A hilly slope at the end of the military runway had to be leveled to make way for the runway extension. The once quiet Changi was transformed into a hive of activity with over 200 lorries plying up and down the airport site. In 1976, the pace of activity moved seaward as additional land had to be reclaimed from the sea. Hydrographic surveys were carried out to measure the depth of the seabed in areas to be dredged. The massive operation required six cutter suction dredges. Their job was to dig up 40 million cubic meters of sand from the seabed. The loosened material was sucked into pipelines and pumped to the reclamation site. In the control room, the cutting process and depth of dredging were monitored closely. The project was undertaken by three Japanese firms appointed by the Port of Singapore Authority. They worked round the clock to finish the project in July 1978, seven months ahead of schedule. 10 kilometers of pipeline snaked their way from the dredging site to the reclamation area. Reclamation created five islands beyond the former Changi coastline. These islands, which marked the site to the second runway, had to be reclaimed first to allow more time for the soil to settle. Sand from the seabed created 700 hectares of new land for the airport. Another 200 hectares were reclaimed using earth from hills outside the airport area. The whole reclamation project cost over $220 million. In terms of land area, it was the biggest reclamation project undertaken in Southeast Asia at that time. The next engineering problem was that of soft marine clay, which threatened to undermine the airport's foundation. The marine clay, which was found below the surface, has a high water content. Without soil treatment, the weight of buildings and airport structures would squeeze out the water over a period of years, resulting in the land sinking and buildings cracking. 
This settlement, which may take from 25 to 50 years, can be accelerated by soil improvement methods. In the late 70s, Chang'e became a hotbed of advanced techniques in soil strengthening. One method was the installation of sand drains. The underlying soft black clay was removed and replaced by columns of sand. A temporary mound of earth was usually placed above the sand drains to simulate the weight of airport structures. This excess load forced water to escape through the sand drains to the surface. With this method, engineers were able to start work on the taxiway and parking bays after only one and a half years, instead of waiting three to five years. Another method was flexible drains made of plastic encased in paper. The flexible drains were installed up to 40 meters in the ground, enabling water to escape by capillary action. It was the first time flexible drains were used in Asia for the construction of an airport. To compact the loose, sandy soil in the reclaimed area, a unique method was chosen. Heavy pounders, weighing 10 to 40 tons, were dropped from a height of up to 40 meters. Huge craters were formed in the ground. This method accelerates settlement from 25 years to two and a half years. Over $30 million literally went underground to provide a firm and stable foundation for the construction of the airport. It seemed as if a man-made tide had washed over the landscape of Changi. It now presented a bare surface awaiting the next change. The runway was the first major project to be undertaken at Changi. The new runway was to be constructed over a military runway first built during the Japanese occupation. It had to be lengthened from 2,000 to 4,000 meters and widened from 45 to 60 meters. When the Public Works Department took over the runway, it was still being used by the Republic of Singapore Air Force. This turned out to be a boom. As trees and buildings hampered survey work, the direction of clearance initially followed the flight path of the military aircraft. The runway pavement structure is similar to that of a road, but to withstand the weight of planes, it's built three times thicker. For safety and comfort, it's also smoother, as jet aircraft take off and land at very high speeds. In November 1977, the southern extension of the runway was completed. The RSAF, which had been using the military runway, moved its operations to the new extension, enabling the Public Works Department to widen and strengthen the military runway. In February 1979, the runway was completed. Near the runway are two man-made reservoirs built for water conservation. The water will be used for firefighting, watering of plants and air-conditioned cooling. The largest building project in Changi was the passenger terminal. To save time, three phases, piling, construction of the basement and of the main building were intertwined. When piling was only 60% completed in November 1977, construction of the basement began. And when the basement was halfway through in May 1978, work on the main building started. This overlapping of activities was necessary to reduce construction time. 
but it also meant that close supervision and coordination were vital, even to the point of having separate entrances for each contractor. Time-saving methods were used in the construction of the passenger terminal. While the supporting columns were being built, precast beams and slabs were manufactured in Bukatima and taken to the site. The slabs were placed on top of the beams, followed by a layer of concrete. This was a faster method requiring less manpower. Despite the use of time-saving methods, the passenger terminal building, referred to as the PTB, faced several construction problems. The PTB has a very wide site coverage. We have a big team of supervisory staff of about 170, and we have approximately 150 suppliers and subcontractors with about 2,000 over workers working daily. So this is quite a big team of people to supervise. And because of this, we suffer a time, low productivity. We also experience a very high factor of wastage of material. The most serious one was the shortage of labor. And uh, not only the shortage, the worker of many numbers are uh, multiracial. So uh, they have uh, different time celebration, uh, such as Chinese New Year, Ale Haria Puasa, Haria Hari, like that. So while these holidays, that we achieve that productivity low. And uh, another uh, problem was that material shortage, particularly that element material, such as aggregate and sand. But with uh, help and coordination by PWD, I think it's over. And the number third is that the distance of this Changi's location. Uh, as an airport, the best location this, I believe. However, that for the construction, from the industrial zone, such as Jurong, is to get uh, material and also the workers. It's very hard. Is it true that your company encountered losses building this passenger terminal? Yes, uh, we made a loss. If that is the case, why did you carry on with the project? Uh, well, because uh, we have a contract with uh, government and we know that significant meaning of this project. How uh, this building is expected to complete it with good quality and target day. So uh, when I, uh, we think about this uh, importantness, uh, we have to achieve this building without any hesitation, without any of the delay, this is that our traditional history, uh, you know, philosophy of our farm. The problems which beset the passenger terminal affected the other airport projects as well. At its peak in 1979 and 1980, Changi Airport employed as many as 5,000 to 6,000 workers, most of whom were foreigners. However, a shortage of workers slowed down the construction of the passenger terminal which required workers from various trades. One of the solutions was for them to work overtime to complete the project. Another problem was the shortage of building materials, including granite, stone, sand and bricks. The airport coordinators had to decide which projects merited priority over others. The passenger terminal, the largest project, was given top priority. And although this meant delaying other projects, like the parking bays and taxiway, the delay was not critical. All the necessary projects were completed in time for the opening of the airport. Construction of the passenger terminal took less than four years quite an achievement for a project of its size. 
sited entirely on reclaimed land, it covers an area of 220,000 square meters. It was designed by the Public Works Department and built at a cost of $300 million. The target date was met through close coordination between the PWD, the Ministry of Communications, the Department of Civil Aviation and the contractors. The Changi Airport is the largest single project undertaken by the Public Works Department, the main developing authority. The PWD set up a Changi Airport Development Division to design and construct the airport. In this former British school at Upper Changi Road, some 80 professionals and 700 technical and daily rated employees worked on the airport project. I think uh, the, slim, the slimness of the core, I think, is... Further. By undertaking the development of Changi Airport, the PWD saved over $50 million in consultancy fees. And what's more important, it has now acquired the professional and technical skills to go into airport consultancy work in the future. The same building housed a laboratory where tests were conducted on building samples from the airport to maintain quality control. What couldn't be tested in the laboratory was taken to the site. Samples of different colored tiles were plastered on a wall of the passenger terminal building to test their durability and aesthetic appeal. For these architects, no detail was too small for scrutiny. This attention to detail was also evident in the landscaping of the airport, which was undertaken by the Parks and Recreation Department. The greening of the airport began as early as 1978. Rain trees were planted in the sunken car park in front of the passenger terminal. Along the coast, stretching over eight kilometers, a variety of coconut trees, sea hibiscus and casuarinas were planted. The construction of the control tower was an engineering challenge. To meet the tight time schedule, the cabin floors were constructed at ground level. This was a time-saving method, enabling both the central core and the cabins to be built at the same time. The plan was to lift the floors up when the central core was completed. The 32 rods connected the cabin floors to lifting beams at the top of the control tower. The future site of the control cabin was transformed into a busy operations room. Four jacks were used in the lifting operation. With each cycle of the jack stroke, the three floors lifted a mere 300 millimeters, hardly discernible to the eye. But eyes were fixed on the water gauge, which had to be level. Any difference would mean a tilt in the structure, which would hamper the lifting operation. At a lifting rate of six meters a day, the three floors weighing 1,350 tons took two weeks to reach the top. It was the first time such a method had been adopted in the region, and it went without a hitch.
The control tower is the most striking landmark in the airport. Towering 78 meters, it's also one of the tallest in the world. While the control tower was being built in 1979, fuel tanks were under construction at the north end of the airport. This fuel installation was formed by six oil companies and named Kefai, or Changi Airport Fuel Hydrant Installation. In April 1980, a jetty was built a kilometer away from the fuel farm to enable tankers to bring jet fuel from local refineries. The project was completed in January 1981. Kefai is one of the biggest fuel farms in terms of capacity. The six tanks can store over 25 million liters of jet fuel. That's three and a half times more than at Payalebar Airport. There's still space for additional tanks to double the capacity. Fuel brought by tankers is carried by two underground feeder pipes to the storage tanks. Here, the fuel is filtered and pumped through two underground pipelines to the aircraft parking bays and cargo area. The underground fueling facilities enable 15 planes to be fueled at one time. On the approach road to the airport is an aircraft bridge built for planes to cross from one runway to another. As it forms a gateway to the airport, it's designed with open arches to avoid a closed tunnel effect. The bridge is built to withstand the load of the largest plane. Parallel to the aircraft bridge are two smaller bridges, one for airport vehicles and the other for public cars. Not all the projects at Changi were built at the site. The roof frame for the Singapore Airlines hangar was built 24 kilometers away on the Indonesian island of Batam. Part of the reason for fabricating the roof separately was that it enabled the construction of the hangar to continue without interruption. The roof is made of giant tubular steel frames welded together. It was built in four sections. First was brought by barge to Changi in February 1981. Compressed air was used to lift the 60-ton roof a fraction of an inch off the ground. This made it easier to tow the roof section to the hangar floor. When the hangar is completed in 1982, it will be one of the largest column-free structures in the world. Imagine three jumbo planes with two smaller aircraft fitting snugly in between. The world's largest single flight kitchen is also found at Changi Airport. Operated by the Singapore Airport Terminal Services, it produces 30,000 meals a day, more than double that to fire labor. This increased output is achieved by the installation of semi-automated equipment which cuts down production time. Mundane chores, such as the movement of galley items, are left to these driverless tow motors. They run on concealed wires and are programmed to stop at designated points. Another flight kitchen run by the Changi International Airport Services will produce an additional 8,500 meals daily. Both CIAS and SATS also have cargo handling facilities with the emphasis on automation. This elevating transfer vehicle at the SATS terminal is programmed to slot cargo into 420 storage positions. It's also used to transfer cargo to the workstation, where the cargo is sorted. Manual labor is reduced to a minimum.
smaller sized cargo is kept in a seven tier rack structure to save space. Storage and retrieval of cargo is done by this stacker crane which can handle 60 boxes an hour. It's operated by remote control. Bulky documents can now be sent to the box movement system, which moves on rails from one office to another. It's the first of its kind to be installed in Singapore. Together, these SATs and CIAS cargo terminals can handle half a million tons of freight a year. By the turn of the century, the capacity would have increased to two and a half million. The eyes of the airport are these communications and navigational aids planned by the Telecoms Authority of Singapore and the Department of Civil Aviation. The nerve center of the communication system is the computerized air traffic control center at Biggin Hill, three kilometers away from the airport. It's named LORADS, an acronym for Long Range Radar and Display System. It houses a sophisticated long range radar which transmits and receives radio signals from aircraft. The operating range, which is 470 kilometers, is more than double that to the first radar at Paya Labor. It enables controllers to guide aircraft much earlier on their approach, eliminating the scramble that's experienced with a shorter range system. Controllers can now guide as many as 250 different aircraft within the controlled airspace. The signals received from the radar are processed by computers for display. The position, identity, height and speed of each aircraft are shown, enabling the controller to monitor its progress. In addition, there are two electronic data displays which give information on flights, weather forecasts and navigational warnings. Singapore, you get away 3 is out of 3,000. KLMA-33, Singapore director, identified, climb to 8,000 feet until further advised. In October 1980, LORADS started trial operations, taking over from Paya Labor Airport. By December, the old control center at Paya Labor had shut down, and LORADS became the new air traffic control center for civil operations in Singapore. Uh, the centre was officially no, opened by the Minister of Communications, Mr. Ong Teng Chung, on the 25th of February, 1981. As the aircraft nears the airport, an approach control radar takes over. It was installed near Changi Airport in mid-1980. With a shorter range of 240 kilometers, its main function is to guide aircraft to the runway. It also serves as a backup radar to the long-range radar. In September 1980, an airport surface detection radar was installed on top of the control tower. As the antenna rotates at very high speeds, it's shielded from strong winds by this dome-shaped structure made of fiberglass. It was assembled in September 1980. The short-range radar enables the controllers to keep track of ground movements on the runway and taxiways. Singapore 692, Singapore. Singapore 692, requesting flight level 330 to Kaohsiung. Singapore 692, The radar, which covers a 10 kilometer radius, enhances safety on the ground as it presents a bright, clear picture to the controllers, even under bad weather conditions. How will these new communications facilities improve the work of the air traffic controllers? 
while the air traffic controllers will now have vastly superior aids uh, that will enable them to do their work uh, and ensure safety as well as to keep aircraft moving that much faster with a minimum of delay of course. To guide pilots to Changi, a radio navigational aid has been installed at Pulau Tekong Kecil, five kilometers northeast of the airport. It's located in line with the second runway. The antennae send out radio signals, giving the pilot his bearing and distance from the station. 23.1. Checks on its accuracy are regularly conducted by the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration. 1980, a year before the opening date, saw the airport at its busiest. From March to August, 34 aero bridges, built by a Japanese company, arrived by sea from Osaka. They were transported by barge to Budok Jetty, and taken to the work site. The fixed portion of the aero bridges were built by a local engineering firm, which also did the installation. The aero bridges are located on two finger piers on both sides of the passenger terminal. Twelve of them have twin heads to speed up the discharge of passengers. October 1980 saw the completion of the main fire station. As Changi Airport is located by the sea, the fire and rescue service has acquired two high-speed firefighting and rescue boats. Each boat is equipped with two firefighting monitors to discharge both foam and water. For rescue purposes, there are also 10 life rafts in each boat, capable of carrying 250 people. In 1980, also saw the completion of two new expressways to Changi Airport. The East Coast Parkway carries traffic from the city to the airport in 25 minutes. The Pan Island Expressway links Changi to the central part of the island, ending at Jurong. Branching off from Airport Boulevard is a new coastal road which was completed in 1981. It carries slower moving vehicles to the cargo complex. The pace of activity heightened a few months before the airport opened. Within the passenger terminal, flight information display boards were put up and travelators installed and tested. In the basement, a building automation system was installed to monitor the airport's mechanical and electrical services, airfield lighting and power supply. In the event of a local power failure, the computer-based system pinpoints the fault and alerts the operator. Ah, there's alarm. I think there's an airport in the incoming cable uh, number one to PDB. So we can close the breaker uh, bus section cover number two. The duty engineer is able to isolate the faulty line and switch to an alternative power source within seconds. This system, which was not available at Pia Labor, enables airport operations to continue without interruption. A historical moment took place on May the 12th, 1981, when the first commercial plane landed at Changi. 
It was one of several familiarization flights arranged by the Department of Civil Aviation to test the runway system and ground handling services. Within the passenger terminal, a group of army personnel were helping the DCA to test the arrival and departure system. The men had to find their way from the check-in counter to the departure channel following the airport signs. This simulation exercise was a means of testing the adequacy of the airport signs and the time taken to move from one airport area to another. Even before its opening, Changi Airport attracted crowds of Singaporeans, eager for a new experience. This group willingly paid over a hundred dollars a head just to be among the first to land at Changi Airport before its operational date. 60. Roger, continue to roll at the end of the runway, 1243. And there are eight uh, luggage conveyors on each side. Now you can see there are four conveyors uh, on this side. Now if for instance Tours were conducted to acquaint the public with the new airport. By mid-June, the stage was set for the opening of the airport. Within the passenger terminal, a handing over ceremony took place to mark the completion of the building. It was a justifiably proud moment. What are the impressions and experiences gained from building the airport? One of the main challenges uh, was to design the passenger terminal building, the control tower, and all the other buildings within Changi Airport within a period of five years. Uh, this, is a, this was a tremendous task as compared to the experiences of other uh, countries, which took approximately seven to ten years. The other challenge was to design the passenger terminal building within a site area of 416 meters wide to cater for 10 million passengers' movements annually. To uh, tackle this task, I had 10 architects working as a team to design and construct this terminal building. We are now uh, looking into the design of the second terminal building, which must be completed sometime in 1986. The design should be about the same as uh, similar to the first terminal building. Uh, before we finalize the design, we would like to try out our terminal building one first to understand the passenger flow and see whether any improvements to be incorporated into the second terminal building. How did you feel when you were first assigned to work at Changi Airport? Oh, when I first heard of upcoming, I'm very happy because it's such a prestigious project and I really want to get involved in the project. However, after I've stuck for a while, you know, all the dreams seems to fade because it is a lot of hard work and tough too. You see, I think a lot of contractors, and for that matter, my male subordinates, I don't think they're used to working under a lady boss, you know, and when I first started, they sort of have a little bit of doubt on me. But uh, I think after a while, when I showed it to them that I could handle the project well and I could make decisions, they will learn to accept me as my male counterpart. The whole runway and taxiway done by me, see? So I'm so proud about that. If my friends ask me how you do the job, I say I as the one who do the job and see it's good. Tell them it's a good runway, good taxiway. Check the lah. Uh, sama-sama eh, yeah. membangunkan uh, dua airport yeah. di Paya Lebar dan di Changi, Changi Airport. Airport eh. yeah. Apa rasa cik? Eh? Adakah cik merasa megah atau yeah. bangga? Eh? Si, saya rasa bangga. Saya boleh berceritakan anak-anak saya belakang hari 
Ah, sini airport saya bekerja, ini airport pun saya bekerja. So of course I was uh, uh, impressed from a uh, functional design and uh, well designed for this uh, terminal building. Uh, but also I was so impressed uh, overall planning interrelated with airport, viaducts uh, and highway, these systems. And uh, especially highway systems uh, was completed in the early day of this construction of the airport. So uh, it's uh, utilized for the transportation from town to this requested construction area. Another thing is that also this is most uh, impressive for me, and I never encountered such as uh, uh, achievement of the greeneries and trees, I mean uh, trees, to so this uh, cultivation and plantation to meet the launching of the airport's uh, completion. Yes, we gained the experience by building a Changi Airport. The amount of consultants were brought to a minimum. We learn as we built. By so doing, we are able to keep the experience within our own people. This experience does not come by every year. For the next 30 years, we will not see Singapore building another airport like uh, Changi. So we are lucky to be in this period to, ex to gain the experience of building the airport. Although one phase of the airport is completed, the work continues to construct a second runway by 1984. Phase two will also see the addition of a second passenger terminal building more aircraft parking bays and other supporting facilities. This will enable Changi to meet the demands of air traffic and passenger movements right up to the 1990s. With the foresight that is characteristic of the development of this airport, sufficient land has been set aside for expansion beyond the year 2000. Despite the incessant activity to finish the airport, one thing was not forgotten by the airport planners. The old Changi beach, which gave way to the new airport, has been replaced by a new beach, over eight kilometers long. The beach stands as a reminder of what Changi once meant to lovers of sun, sand and sea. Who knows, the sounds of picnickers and swimmers may once again breathe life to Changi. On 30th June, the eve of the opening of the new airport, Paya Leba was in a flurry of activity. Apart from its scheduled flights, 21 planes from seven airlines flew without passengers to Changi to be ready for takeoff the following day. On the ground, huge convoys comprising an assortment of airport vehicles trundled past the Paya Leba taxiway on the long journey to Changi. Over 2,000 pieces of ground servicing equipment were loaded onto 1,000 moving units and taken to Changi over three nights from 29th of June to the 1st of July. Personnel from the police, army, Department of Civil Aviation and airline companies were involved in the biggest move in local aviation history. The Pan Island Expressway and Tempinus Road were closed to the public to make way for the convoys. For the Department of Civil Aviation, Changi will be its third home after Kalang and Paya Leba. The last departure flight at 11 p.m. marked the close of an aviation chapter. After the passengers had left, 
there was time for a few hurried snapshots before a quiet hush fell on the airport. For a quarter of a century, Bayer Leber had served us well, but it was time to move to a bigger airport. Bayer Leber will, however, assume a new role as a military and civil airport, handling spillover flights from Changi until the second runway is completed. On the morning of July 1st, military planes from the Republic of Singapore Air Force made a farewell fly past over Changi, their home for 10 years. Shortly after 7, the first scheduled flight landed at Changi Airport. It was a Singapore Airlines Boeing 727 from Kuala Lumpur. Changi Airport came alive with the sound of planes and apron vehicles. Three-year-old James Ng led the first group of passengers into the terminal. Even this infant received the VIP welcome. Changi Airport had opened with a bang. But after the initial excitement, the airport got down to business. A new chapter in the story of Changi has been written. From a popular beach resort, it has become a modern international airport. But this chapter is only the beginning. The Changi story will unfold when the airport is put to the test and the vision of the planners becomes a reality.